Evet. Okay, we're happy to have um, Jenny Wilson telling us about the top degree rational cohomology of the special linear group of a number ring. Uh, great, thank you. And thanks to all the organizers for uh, inviting me and for executing such an excellent conference despite, despite the global situation. Um, Great, so let me begin the talk with a little bit of review from what I think happened this morning, although I haven't had a chance to watch the lectures myself yet. Um, but let me, I guess, first set up some notation. Uh, for this talk, I will let F denote a number field. So, uh, by that, I mean a, a finite extension of the rationals, field extension, the rational numbers. Um, so should have in mind things like the rational numbers, maybe the rational numbers adjoin I or adjoin your favorite root. Okay. And I will write R to denote the ring of integers in F. So by that I mean the set of all solutions over F to monic polynomials in, um, in co with coefficients in, uh, in Z in the integers. So we should have in mind things like, well, the integers inside Q, the Gaussian in integers. Um, I don't know, here's a quadratic example, join one plus the square root of five all over two. Okay. And um, I believe that earlier today, there was already a discussion of the borel serre theorem where uh, perhaps you saw the virtual cohomological dimension of the special linear group uh, with coefficients in, or with entries in R. And it turns out that this VCD only depends on the number of real and the number of complex pairs of embeddings of F. Uh, so specifically, here's, here's a formula for this VCD. Okay, where here R is the number of real embeddings of F. And Uh, C is the number of complex conjugate pairs of embeddings that don't factor through R. Um, great. So notably, this the VCD it's known, and it is quadratic in N. Um, for example, when uh, when R is the integers, then the VCD is N choose two. And so, moreover, I think you saw earlier today that the special linear group in R is a virtual duality group. with dualizing module uh, this representation of SNLN R that I'll denote STN of F, um, which is called the Steinberg module. OK. 
Okay. So we'll recall what that is shortly, but just a reminder that this statement means, this means, so let me adjust this. So, Uh, what this means is that if I look at the cohomology of SLNR, the coefficient in a rational SLNR representation in O dimension I, then this uh, virtual duality means that this is isomorphic in a natural way to the homology of SLNR with coefficients in the tensor product of V with the Steinberg module. So this, this holds for all, um, all rational SLNR representations B. Okay, great. And so notably, notably for present purposes, when I take um, V just to be the rational numbers, then what we get is that the co-dimension I cohomology of SLNR, um, we can compute by looking at the degree I homology of SLNR with coefficient in the rationalized Steinberg module. Okay. So I can operate this tablet. Um, so right, to compute to compute these groups. This tells us that one thing we can do, let's consider the case when V is just trivial coefficients in the rational numbers. Um, one, one approach to computing these groups is we can take a resolution of our Steinberg module by flat, SLNR modules, take covariance, and then take the homology of the resulting complex. Okay. And so what this tells us is that the key to computing the rational cohomology of our special linear group close to its VCD um, is coming up with nice flat resolutions of the Steinberg module. And by nice, I mean resolutions where it is feasible to compute the covariance. Okay, so that, that is the goal of this program. So let's recall what the Steinberg module is. So I think this was also discussed earlier this morning, but let's let's recall that. The, the Tietz building, I'll denote TNF is a simplicial complex. Where the vertices correspond to uh, proper non-zero subspaces of F to the N. And P simplices correspond to flags. And this, this complex comes with a natural action of 
SLNR. Okay, so said otherwise, this teach building is the realization of the poset of uh, proper non-zero subspaces of F of the N under inclusion. Okay, and it's a theorem of Solomon and Teeps. that um, this complex is homotopy equivalent to a wedge of spheres in dimension n minus two. And since we're working with an infinite field, it's going to be an infinite wedge of spheres. So there is a, um, a proof, or, or not the original proof, but a proof of this result in the exercises uh, that come with this lecture. Okay, great. And um, one consequence of this is that this Keats building has reduced homology only in its top dimension, which is n minus two. So recall definition, the Steinberg module. Whoa, oops. The Steinberg module is uh, or defined to be the reduced homology of the Teats building integer coefficients um, in degree n minus two. Okay, so now our, our key to computing a nice resolution of the Steinberg module is going to be uh, to understand the topology of these Teats buildings. Um, and uh, in, in the exercises, uh, you will be guided through the exercise of computing the Sharpley resolution of the Steinberg module, which um, was used to uh, compute its covariance, And so compute the homology in, in, de in degree zero. Okay. So the motivating question for the talks that I give is the following. Um, here's a question. What, what is the largest degree that the special linear group has non-vanishing rational, uh, rational homology. So in general, the answer to this is not known, even, even when R is the integers. Um, but let me, let me survey some results in this direction that are known. Start a new page for that. Some known results. Great. So, one thing that we know is that when R is Euclidean. Then the cohomology vanishes in its virtual cohomological dimension. And this is due to Lee and Charba. And I'll, I'll remind us, this is not a contradiction. So remember, uh, one, um, one way that you can even define the, the virtual cohomological dimension is um, it's the, the top uh, degree where there is some rational SLNR representation where this group is non-vanishing. It does not mean that it is non-vanishing when we take coefficients in Q. And in fact, we see that in the case of an R is Euclidean. So when, for example, when R is the integers, we do have vanishing in this top degree. Okay. Um, for N at least two. For N, oh, thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, great. 
In contrast, it does not vanish in the case that R is not a PID. So this, this is due to search R and Putman. Okay. And it's also non-vanishing when N is even and F is the quadratic field extension to adjoin the square root of D in the case when D is equal to minus 43, minus 67, or minus 163. This is Miller, Hutz, myself, and Don Misaki. Okay, so, so these are examples of um, PIDs that are not Euclidean. So they are excluded from these, um, these other two cases. And um, in fact, if you assume the generalized Riemann hypothesis, which I have on some authority is a reasonable thing to assume, then the only number ring not on this list is the case of this, the number ring in this quadratic field extension when D is equal to negative 19. Okay. So that is results about the top degree. There is also some results known about the uh, co-dimension one degree. Uh, and specifically, let's see here, when we look at one degree below, the top, then this is known to vanish in the case R equals Z. Oh, and I probably I didn't write this down, but I think I need N at least three for this one. This is due to Church Putman. Maybe Jeremy can spot me on whether I got the right down there. And again, um, we have vanishing when R is the Gaussian or Eisenstein integers. Um, and this last result is due to, whoops. Um, Miller, Hutz, myself, and, um, oh, I put this in the wrong order, right? Cooper's, Miller's. That's and myself. All right, ah, and that's incorrect in the notes. I'll have to fix that. Um, great. So the goal for today's talk is to understand, zoom out, the first of the results on this list. So our goal for today is to understand this result originally due to Lee and Sharba, that when R is a Euclidean ring, then we have vanishing of our cohomology group in the top degree. Okay. 
Okay, so today the goal is this result of Lee and Sharba. Okay, so let's assume that R is Euclidean. So my favorite Euclidean rings are number rings are the integers, Gaussian integers. There are many more. Okay. And a reminder that, well, uh, first of all, by duality, if we want to understand this top degree cohomology group, then we need to understand the zeroth degree homology group. Oh, I need that. Let's, let's stick with R. So we can you can take R to be integers if you're so inclined. Um, so it's going to be the zeroth degree homology group with coefficients in R rationalized Steinberg module, okay? And this then is going to be the same as it's going to be isomorphic to the SLNR invariants of this rationalized Steinberg module. So maybe I'll say as an aside, remember that what I mean by this, the co-invariants of a G representation M, which I will denote by M sub G. This means the quotient of M by the submodule generated by terms of the form M minus G sub M. So this is going to be the, um, the largest quotient of M with trivial G action. This is, these are the covariants. Okay, so this is what we're trying to compute. We want the SLNR covariants of our Steinberg module over Q. Okay. So the strategy is that we want to find a sufficiently nice generating set for the Steinberg module. Specifically, we want to find want to find generators of the Steinberg module that vanish in this covariance quotient. Um, Oh, and I have stopped writing the tensor with Q, but I guess from, from now on, I will implicitly take my Steinberg module to be with rational coefficients. Great. So let's first think about the case when N is two. Great, so we want to consider the Keats building for n equals two, which is by definition, just the set of lines in F2. This is, this is a discrete set. Okay. So if we look at the reduced homology in degree zero, of this Teats building, then it is generated by these formal distant differences in, in points, which are, which I will write as they're these index set of lines. Okay. 
Okay. So let's specialize even more and consider the case that R is the integers. And so a point in this reduced homology group could be something like the following. I could take the point X to be the formal difference in the line spanned by one zero and the line spanned by zero one. Great. So observe now that if we take the following matrix in SL2Z, let's think about what this matrix does. So this matrix um, interchanges these two lines. It's going to map this line to this line and this line uh, back to this line. I guess it also reflects the line, but we're just interested in the action induced on, on the subspace. And so this means that, well, when I act by this matrix on this element in my degree zero homology group, it is going to negate it. And so because we're working rationally, this means that this element is going to be zero in covariance. Great. So, so far, so good. Let me, let me just back up a minute and remind us what we're doing. So backing up completely, our goal is to show that this top homology group vanishes. We've reduced this to a question of showing that when we take the Steinberg module with rational coefficients, that the SL and R covariance vanished. And so the Steinberg module by definition was this top degree homology of our teeth building. So we're, we're trying to understand what we're trying to show vanishing of the, the covariance of this top degree homology group. And so far, this looks like really good news. We wrote down an element in our, in our homology group and we showed that this element vanishes when we pass to covariance, since we found an element of our group that acts on it by negation. Okay, so, so far so good, this is going well, um, except if we look at the next example of an element in this homology group, if I take R to be the integers again, and let's um, consider now the element Y, which is the difference between following two lines. So the line spanned by one zero and the line spanned by one two. And now we run into a problem, problem, and I'll leave this, the statement as an exercise. Um, it's a problem that there is no element oops. there is no element in SLN, SL32, Z, that interchanges these lines. Okay. Um, so this, this, this statement, I'll, I'll leave as an exercise, it's in the exercise sheet. Um, but I can tell you uh, morally the, the reason that there is no such matrix here um, is because when I take um, when I take this this basis for uh, 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 if I take let me put it this way if I take generators for each of these lines and I choose my generators so that I end up with um, uh, I choose my generators so that they are primitive uh, vectors over Z. That means I, I choose my generators so that they have integer coefficients 
that um, are co-prime that are that have no common GC common GCD is one. So, for example, if I take generators of these two lines, like the two that I've written down here, well, in this case, these two generators are not a basis for Z two. These generators um, are are not a basis for for Z two. It's an exercise to check that they, in fact, span a uh, submodule of Z two that is index two. And and we can we can check that because if I uh, make them the columns of a matrix, then that matrix has determinant two. Okay, so said otherwise, the problem is that if I look at both of these lines and I intersect each of these lines with Z2, then the sum of the resulting submodules in Z2 are index two. Let me write that down. So in other words, so this sum is index two in Z2. Alas, so our trick failed in this case we are not able in such an easy and direct way to check that this particular generator vanishes in the covariance. Okay, so the, the key claim, the key to this proof is that uh, when R is Euclidean, then the Steinberg module is going to be generated by um, differences of lines that look like the ones we had in the first example. So it's generated by um, classes like the following where when I look at When I look at this sum, I get all of R2. Okay, and, and again, I can I can think of the same property if I prefer. I can uh, think it was of a typo you meant to write Steinberg 2. Oh, yes, thank you. I did mean to write Steinberg 2. Yes, thank you. Um though, so, right, we'll have an analog of this statement for um the whole ring. In fact, maybe maybe I should just state this. Let, let me just state this in general. Let me, I'll change this back to an N. I'm just gonna give the general statement. Uh, no, I changed my mind, I won't do that. Okay, um, great. So, ah, so let me say though, let me rephrase this condition again and remind us that we can also think of it as coming from um, uh, a basis for R2. So the same condition, on the lines is um, I can think of as the statement that uh, these two lines um, are generated by uh, elements of a basis for R2. Okay, and these um, these generators uh, are called integer integral apartment classes. Okay, great. So, right. So now, let me give a let me let me uh, give a little bit more background, and then we'll be able to state the results in general for for general n. 
Um, here is a definition. Um, oh, actually, I, I don't know. Was there was there any discussion of apartment classes in the earlier talks today? Maybe the audience can. I, think I defined it right, but I, not everybody was there at my talk. So go ahead and just give a quick definition for sure. Great. Okay. Very good. So, um, great. Let me remind us that um, a a frame for a vector space is um, by definition a decomposition into lines. Okay. And uh, given a frame for our vector space Fn, um, we are going to let this notation S of L1, L2 up to Ln denote the following subcomplex of the Tietz building. Remember, this is this is my my Tietz building is my simplicial complex of flags of subspaces in F to the N. I'm going to let for, for this decomposition into lines, I'm going to define a subcomplex. It's going to be the full subcomplex on vertices indexed by direct sums of um, direct sums of any proper non-empty subset of these lines. Okay, and again, uh, oh, full full subcomplex means I'm going to tell you the vertices, and I want you to take those vertices and all simplices in the complex span by those vertices and or any subset of those vertices. Okay, so this subcomplex. Um, is called an apartment. Okay. And in the um, exercises, in fact, in, in one of the exercise series uh, in, in the package for these lectures, you will, uh, I guess, investigate um, what the definition of a building is and why the Teats building is in fact a building. Um, and in the process of doing so, you will verify that these apartments are homotopy equivalent to spheres of dimension n minus two. I'm told it's a requisite for all of these talks that, that I draw this, this triangle. So here's an example of what this what an apartment can look like when n equals three. Okay, here's here's the subcomplex of the teach building I get in the case n equals three. Um, and, and in general, I, the, the key to doing this exercise is to realize that you can identify this apartment class um, with the very centric subdivision of the boundary of an n minus one simplex. Great, but we'll leave that to the exercises. Okay. So uh, you'll maybe recall that, that uh, Solomon and Tietz proved that the Tietz building is homotopy equivalent to a uh, wedge of n minus two spheres. Um, in fact, their, their result was stronger than that. They proved that the um, they proved that this top degree homology, is generated by apartment classes. Right, so it's it's generated by 
the homology classes I get by the inclusions of these spheres. Okay. And so key to our main result is the following theorem of Ash and Rudolph. They prove that when R is Euclidean, um, and in fact, not necessarily a number ring, so this is for general Euclidean rings R, they proved that this top degree homology group is in fact generated by integral apartment classes. So it's generated not only by, um, by these apartments, but it's generated by these apartments where this frame arises from a basis for R to the N. All right, so let me state that. Then this top degree homology group is generated by integral apartment classes. IE, it's generated by the apartment classes associated to frames where when I intersect with Rn, then the lines I get span Rn. Okay, so these are frames arising from an integral basis for Rn. And in my next talk, I'll uh, look at how one might prove this Ash-Rudolph theorem. Um, but for the rest of today, I want to instead look at um, how we can use this result to prove Lee and Charba's result that uh, the, the top degree homology, cohomology of SLNR vanishes. Okay, so the goal, the goal is a proof of Lee and Charba's result, assuming the Ash Rudolph result. Okay, and before we embark on that, let me back up and recap what we're doing. Okay, so going back a slide, remember it is our goal to prove this result of Lee and Sharba that when R is Euclidean and we look at the special linear group with entries in R, then the rational cohomology vanishes in its top degree, in the, in the top, in the VCD, in the top degree where it might possibly be non-zero. Okay, so that's our goal. And by this duality result, by our virtual Fury Ekman duality result, the, this, we can identify this top degree cohomology group with the SLNR covariance of our rationalized Steinberg module. But the Steinberg module is the top degree homology of the Tietz building. Okay, so our goal to proving this vanishing result is we wanna show that the SLNR covariance of this top degree hom uh, homology of our Steinberg module vanishes. So what did we just see? We just saw that the homology, the top degree homology of our, uh, 
of our Tietz building is generated by these apartment classes. So it's generated by these subcomplexes indexed by frames that look like very centrically subdivided boundaries of spheres. And Ash and Rudolph proved that when R is Euclidean, then in fact, the, uh, this top degree homology of our Tietz building is generated by integral apartment classes. So that means it's generated by apartments where this decomposition into lines comes not just for a basis for the vector space over a field, but in fact, a basis over R, uh, for R to the N over R. Okay. And in that case, we're almost done because now we can basically use that same trick that we used in the N equals two case. Okay. So where are we? We're trying to prove Lee Sharba. As we just discussed, it's, it suffices. We're, we're trying to show that the covariance vanish. So it, because this, um, uh, because the Steinberg module is generated by integral apartment classes, it suffices to show that uh, integral apartment classes vanish in the quotient of SLNR covariance. Okay, so let's do that. Let's choose an integral frame. So in other words, let's assume that uh, I can, this, this is a frame arising from some basis, some R basis, V1 up to the N or Rn, okay. And so then we can do the same thing we did before. We can find an, ele uh, an element of SLN R that swaps these first two lines, and then let's just say fixes all of the other lines. Okay. So specifically, everybody should check that this matrix I'm writing down does in fact have um, determinant one. I can look at the matrix. I need this negative sign to make that determinant one. Okay, so here's, here's an element of SLN R um, written with respect to this basis. I written, wrote the matrix with respect to that basis. So written, yeah. written with respect to the basis B1 up through the n. Okay. And so this is, I guess, an awkward page break, but let's um let's look back. So notice this is um this is exactly hooked up so that this matrix, when I look at the map induced on lines, it's going to interchange the lines L1 and L2. It's going to it's going to interchange the basis elements V V1 and uh, and, and negative V2. Okay, so that tells us that he's going to send L1 to L2, L2 to L1, and all subsequent lines are fixed. Okay, and um, this means that G is going to stabilize the corresponding apartment class uh, 
um, and act because this is an odd permutation on these this set of lines. It's going to act by an orientation reversing simplicial map. Okay. So that means that when I look at its action on my apartment class, it's going to negate it. Like here's the picture in the case when n equals three. So what is G doing? G is going to swap L1 and L2 and just swap these two subspaces. And so it's acting on this sphere by a reflection. You can check that's an orientation reversing map. And so it's going to negate the corresponding homology class. And this is exactly what we wanted. So the details of this are left as an exercise that these Gs will always negate these classes. Um, but the upshot of that result is that these integral apartment classes are going to vanish in covariance. Okay, but Ash and Rudolph told us that they generate, so that tells us that the, the covariance vanish. And so we're done. This implies that when we look at this top degree homology of SLNR with rational coefficients, then it will vanish. Great. So that concludes the proof. Um, and in fact, that concludes my talk. So maybe I'll stop here and I don't know if there's more time. At the end, I can give a preview of more of the exercises for the talk. Thanks, Jenny. Are there, are there questions, I guess, first from Zoom and probably just speak Maybe we can uh, start with one question here and uh, Zoom people are uh, raising their hands to, um, uh, so we can prepare that. And my question is what happens integrally? Does this cohomology group also vanish integrally? Is it at least known in some examples? Um, oh, that is a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. Um, yeah, the, the bad news is that, I mean, this entire duality setup only, only holds rationally. And so this, this kind of approach of analyzing covariance of the Steinberg module uh, just doesn't speak to the, the integral question. Um, and so unfortunately, I'm, I'm at least speaking for myself, I'm at a loss at how to address the question of what happens integrally. Um, it's all, I should also point out that um, because because, uh, uh, well, SLN said to say, because it's a torsion group, integrally, it's going to have, um, you know, cohomology in, in, in all dimensions, and so um, in, in all degree. And so we, we don't even have the same, uh, right, it, does, they're, they're, uh, it, it doesn't make sense to ask about the top cohomology in that case. Yeah, yeah the, the, the Steinberg, but the Steinberg covariants do vanish integrally. Uh, so Jenny's argument, you need to invert two. But as Jenny said, basically, we why do we care about homology with coefficients in Steinberg when we don't have duality? Uh, so you need 
Q coefficients are actually, you know, you need to invert all of whatever, you know, all of the torsion primes in uh, SLNR in order to get duality. So, yeah, there's something like slightly more clever you can do to get integral vanishing, but. So, sorry, integral, integral vanishing of the. Of the covariance. Of the covariance, I see. Oh, sorry, what was the question about integral vanishing of covariance or was it about inter integer homology, cohomology? I'm not sure. Uh, it was about uh, homology because Peter already told me that. <laughs> <laughs> We were chatting. <laughs> Sorry for answering whatever Peter already told you. No, it's good that everybody else got to know that as well. But that could be an exercise. Find find that relation and prove that the corn variants also vanish integrally. Oh yeah, actually, I think I think Jeremy recommended that as an exercise, and I never added it to my list. So everybody should pencil in the exercise of try to try to show covariance vanish without inverting two. Um, but then, unfortunately, that doesn't that doesn't speak to homology of SLNZ. Yeah, please. Yeah, so yeah, I was kind of curious about the non vanishing of your uh, BCD in these three numbers. So, in any sense, the, the class number one sort of kicks in. So, because, uh, right, where it is. Uh, yeah, the first page. So, this uh, 43, 6, and I mean, so is it somehow like the so the class number one sort of kicks in in the game, or? Yeah, that's right, absolutely. So in fact- um, in, the, in, Like smaller one not showing up. <laughs> in, in church, or sorry, in, in church for Putman, they like construct classes um, and, and show, they give lower bounds on the, um, on the dimension of, of these cohomology groups that is a function of the class number. I didn't hear that. Did you? No. <laughs> I, I didn't hear that, Jenny. Can you say that oh, again? <laughs> sorry, that's right. So um, in the Church Farb Putman paper, they um, construct classes in, in this top degree cohomology group of, of SLNR, and they give lower bounds on the dimension of, of this group where the those bounds are a function of the class number of the PID. So that this is magic as far as I'm concerned. Uh, so, so, so in the in the construction of the class, it's safe to use something uh, of the class number. Okay. Absolutely, that's right. Yeah, it's it's the it's the class number minus one raised to n minus one is their lower bound. Ah, thank you. And, and is there any reason like the smaller number doesn't show up? I mean, it's not like all of the class number one, right? You have like some smaller primes that not showing, well, yeah, not showing up. So, sorry, I beg your pardon. So the question was, uh, why does negative nineteen doesn't go into like why doesn't that work? Oh right, sorry. So this is right. That's a different question. So in this, right, these um, in in this example, these are um, right PIDs, and so right class number one, and so. Um, Church Barb Putman's result does not speak to those classes. Um, and that's right. So in this paper, uh, effectively what happens is um, we uh, use known results about the case when n equals two and kind of a spectral sequence argument to bootstrap uh, these these classes up to higher values of n, and somehow uh, this works uh, for these three uh, these three rings. But in the case equals minus nineteen, there there just isn't homology in the or cohomology in the n equals two 
case. So, right, so unfortunately our methods don't speak to that either. Um, right, so it's open, as is the case when n is odd. Any more questions? If there are no more questions, I don't know, I'm not seeing any, uh, let me show the participants, are there any raised hands? No, there are no more questions. Um,